Okay, folks, welcome to another session of PHI331. Uh, today, uh, we're going to be moving on to a new unit. Uh, we finished our discussion of reparations last week, which was sort of uh, an end to our broader unit on property rights and inequality. Uh, so for our final topic of the course, we're going to be thinking about democracy. Uh, what criticisms of democracy might there be? Um, what might we be able to say in defense of democracy? Uh, and then towards the end of the unit, we're also going to look at some questions about uh, if we're going to have democracy, uh, how ought it to be run? Uh, so we're going to look at the question of whether uh, voting should be mandatory um, and we're also going to think about the question of whether the voting age uh, ought to be lowered. Uh, so, uh, today we are going to start this unit on democracy off with a classic. We're going to look at uh, Book 8 of Plato's Republic. Uh, so, uh, you'll recall that we looked at Book 2 of Plato's Republic way back in January. Uh, so we're going to return to Plato and we're going to see a bunch of important themes repeating themselves. Um, and we're also going to see some new criticisms of democracy. Uh, so here's the plan. I'm going to break our video discussion into two parts. Uh, so today, um, for part one, we're going to look at some central points from last time, uh, fill in some gaps uh, from what we skipped over in books three through seven. Not everything, of course, but uh, a couple of big important moves. Uh, and then we're going to consider the progression of the different kinds of states uh, that Plato lays out in uh, book eight. And then uh, in the second video, uh, we're going to look directly at some of the central problems with a democratic state uh, that Plato lays out in Book 8. Well, here's uh, maybe one criticism of democracy that uh, might feel a little more contemporary. Uh, this is a cartoon drawn by Will McPhail. He uh, works for The New Yorker, and uh, if you uh, like this comic, uh, and also, if you like comics with sort of a feminist uh, overtone uh, or approach, uh, I recommend you look up uh, some of Will McPhail's other work. Uh, but here's this one. This guy's saying, These smug pilots have lost touch with regular passengers like us. Who thinks I should fly the plane? Uh, and everybody around him is raising their hands. The problem that you're seeing here is very much like, as we'll see, the problem that <clears throat> Plato is raising for democracy. Uh, so just to review, here are some of the main takeaways that you might remember uh, from our earlier discussion uh, of the Republic. Uh, so one is that there's this question of why we should act justly, why a just life is a good life and one to be pursued. Um, and we'll remember that Thrasymachus and Glaucon uh, raise the challenge to Socrates uh, by saying that maybe the unjust life, the, the life where you lie, cheat, and steal uh, whenever you can get away with it, is going to be the life that's to be lived for you. Uh, and in answering this question of why we should ask just, act justly, uh, Socrates points out that there's an analogy between justice in a person and justice in a city. Uh, the word justice means one thing, uh, and it's a quality that can be had in people and in cities. Uh, so Socrates' plan is to answer the question of why we should ask ju act justly uh, by thinking about what a just city looks like, uh, whether it's happy, 
And then we can return to our discussion of the individual. We can say, what does a just soul look like? And ask whether the just soul is a happy one. So that's the overall argumentative strategy in the Republic. Uh, one thing that we also noticed is that Plato's proposals for promoting harmony and justice in the just city, uh, the city that he calls Callipolis, uh, that the strategy for promoting harmony and justice comes at the cost of many freedoms that we value today. Uh, so we'll remember that Socrates, while further discussing the just city with Adiamantus towards the end of book two, they talk about uh, the extent of censorship that's going to go on in a perfectly just city. Uh, so what does a just city look like? Well, remember that Socrates uh, develops a three-part account of what the soul looks like. It's got a rational part, a spirited part, and the appetitive part. Um, so the just city has three classes. Uh, there's the philosophical ruling class, the auxiliaries, these are uh, like warriors, uh, and then uh, workmen. Uh, and Socrates' thought is that the just city is one where each person does the right job for them. So the rulers are going to rule over the auxiliaries and the workmen. Uh, and that there's a similar analogy that we have here. So a just person is one whose soul is properly arranged. So we have reason, uh, you know, the part of you that's capable of philosophical thought, uh, ruling over the spirited part of you. So these are your emotions that are responsive uh, to rational thinking. So for instance, certain intentions and maybe certain emotional responses, uh, maybe emotional responses like love uh, could be responsive to the way you think about the world. Well, that's going to be your spirited part of your soul. Uh, and then that's going to rule over your appetites. Uh, so states of being like being hungry or being in the grip of sexual lust. Uh, these are the appetitive parts of your soul. And the idea is that uh, to rule yourself justly, uh, you're going to have reason rule over your appetites and your spirit. Well, a similar thing is going to happen in the city. Uh, that uh, the philosophical class is going to rule over uh, soldiers and the working class. Uh, and that's because everybody has a right job for them, right? So the, the reasonable, the right job for them is to rule. Uh, those who don't have reason uh, are to uh, not uh, manage the affairs of the city, but are instead supposed to, uh, you know, do the work that the city needs. So just a couple of other important moves uh, that show up in the Republic uh, in books three to seven uh, that you should know about. So one is this idea of the noble lie. Uh, so here Socrates says, well, we should realize that the way that a person ends up in one of these three classes, rational, spirited, or repetitive in the classes of people within the just city, that we should say that, you know, there are th there's sort of a class of people with gold in their souls, a class with silver, and a class with bronze in their souls. Now, the idea is that an aptitude for rationality or reason is going to depend on whether you have uh, the right quality of soul. Uh, so this is going to come up in Socrates' discussion of how we go from a perfectly just city like Callipolis and progress all the way down to tyranny. 
Uh, we then also get uh, through the middle of the Republic an account of what a proper education for a guardian of Callipolis is going to look like. And the idea that Socrates lays out is that philosopher kings are going to study for a long time. Uh, they're going to work their way up from gymnastics to music uh, and uh, literature. Of course, the stories will be selected so as to inculcate virtue in a person. Uh, but these studies will go all the way up to the age of 50. And the last step is to study philosophy and the form of the good, to think about goodness itself. And once you've gotten that comprehensive education, that is uh, when you are fit to rule. Uh, just remember, like, in Plato's Just City, the rulers are going to be philosophers because only philosophy uh, can get us in touch uh, with the form of the good itself. Yeah. So Plato points out that you don't learn about the form of the good through empirical investigation or by doing practical things. It's only by, uh, you know, avoiding uh, the material world, avoiding having to work for money. Uh, because if you work for money, your passions won't be rightly aligned to get you in touch with the form of the good. Uh, but uh, one thing that we see in Book Eight of, of, of the Republic, now that we've gotten there, is that a just city isn't going to last forever. So this aristocracy, the Callipolis, a just city ruled by philosopher kings is going to devolve into timarchy or timocracy, uh, a government in the style of the Spartans. Uh, and that uh, timocracy is going to devolve into oligarchy, uh, ruled by the rich, which then devolves into democracy, uh, ruled by all which then finally devolves into tyranny, uh, a state of anarchy, disorder, and uh, rule by a single tyrant. Uh, so how does this progression happen? Well, uh, that is basically the entire project of Book 8. So I've laid this out into a bit of a chart, a bit of a map through Book 8. So we've got some questions here, right? Who's doing the ruling? Uh, that's going to determine what kind of uh, government, what kind of form of government we have. Uh, what is their fundamental guiding value? What is the state of a soul that's analogous to that kind of government? And what causes the downfall or dissolution of this kind of government? So we've already gotten a picture of the aristocracy, right? It is ruled by philosopher kings. Reason rules over spirit and appetite. Uh, and the fundamental value in aristocracy for Plato is the form of the good or harmony, or we might even say something like each thing doing the job that's meant for it. Uh, so reason rules, spirit moves us, and appetites are there to sustain us, maintain our bodies. Uh, and we can just imagine that if you have a soul that's like the just city, you're going to have everything that's doing its job, right? So you're going to have a harmonious and happy soul. But what causes the downfall of the just city? Well, at 547a, Socrates points out that, well, remember that noble lie of people having gold or silver or bronze in their souls? Well, Socrates points out that if you beget your children uh, at the wrong time, and there's a very complicated passage that you don't need to get to the bottom of, where... 
Socrates basically points out that if you get the math wrong and you conceive your children on the wrong night, uh, you might get a little bit of uh, bronze or silver into the souls of those who were meant to have purely golden souls. Uh, and what happens eventually is once enough of the wrong children are begotten, uh, we move out of a proper aristocracy and we end up with a ruling class that is unphilosophical. So this is the timocracy or the timarchy uh, where honor and military victory are treated as crucial. So remember if we go back to you know, our little diagram uh, instead of having the rational part of the city rule it, now we have the honor-loving, spirited, militaristic part of the city ruling it. Uh, so, uh, instead of the form of the good and reason ruling the city, we now have honor and military might uh, running the city. And just like we can think of the Spartan-style government, we can also think of the analogous soul. So what is a person uh, going to be like if they're like a timocratic government? Well, they're going to be hot-tempered and victory-loving. Right? They're going to be prideful. Uh, but what happens then? Well, uh, we start to find rivalries, right? Uh, and a shift towards focus on money instead of virtue. Uh, so we find a passage where Socrates points out that the son of a Timocratic man will eventually uh, see that their father uh, is often ridiculed, often by the mother, uh, for not caring about money. Uh, so eventually, through the generations, rivalries as well as uh, a shift towards focus on money instead of virtue uh, leads us towards an oligarchy where only the rich rule. Uh, so the fundamental value in an oligarchy is going to be money. right? And what happens in a state that values money? Well. Uh, your soul, well, we'll see that in a state that values money, you're going to have the wrong people governing, right? It won't be a matter of who's the most competent, but instead it'll just be a matter of who's the richest, right? So that's going to be uh, a poorly run state. Uh, and moreover, if you have an oligarchic soul, uh, you are going to think about everything in dollars and cents. And you're going to become miserly. So instead of spending your money on things that uh, money can be good for, uh, you're going to keep it to yourself as much as you can. Um, and you're also going to hide the fact that you have money from others. Uh, so this is going to make your soul non-harmonious because you're going to be hiding uh, your love of money, and your acquisition of it from others. Uh, so there's an extent to which uh, your soul is going to be doing a lot of doublespeak, right? Uh, and moreover, once you have people who are just guided by concern of money, you're going to have divisions within a society. And this is going to lead to uh, the overthrow of an oligarchy. So we get resentment and an overthrow of the oligarchic government uh, by the poor because of those feelings of resentment. Uh, so it's almost like they rise up in a revolution against uh, the rich. Uh, so we might think that there's uh, even a bit of anticipation of some of the things that Marx will eventually say that 
um, the accumulation of money um, and that kind of society is eventually going to lead to um, a revolution and an overthrow of that kind of government. Uh, but once we have an overthrow of a money-driven society, we find ourselves in uh, democracy. So here we have rule done by the masses and by the poor, right? And the fundamental value that Socrates thinks comes about in a democratic government is freedom. Uh, so when we get to video part two, we're going to talk about why uh, Plato sees freedom as a bad thing. Uh, but the way that he puts it here is like the democratic city will be the most beautiful kind of city. He even says that you'll have uh, sort of like a bazaar of regimes, which you might think of as like kind of like a marketplace of ideas. He says it'll be, uh, you know, beautiful, like an embroidered quilt uh, with many different fabrics and patterns. Uh, but even though it's this beautiful marketplace of ideas with uh, this great variety of ways of life and all this freedom, uh, it's going to be incapable of harmony or organization. Right? And this will eventually lead to uh, the downfall of the democratic state. So it's that uh, with this amount of disorganization that we also have in uh, the democratic city, uh, we'll eventually get factions, right? And once uh, leaders in a democracy uh, are leading factions, there will be disputes, disagreements. Um, and once leaders uh, get a taste for blood, uh, they will basically uh, be completely willing to shed blood in order to stir up factions. Uh, so we end up moving from a democracy to this sort of mass hysteria uh, where we've got uh, violent and cruel leaders uh, and their governance isn't governed by a value of freedom, but rather uh, the power and the benefit of leaders. Uh, now this is basically where book eight stops. Uh, book nine then moves into a discussion of what a tyrannical soul looks like. Um, so Socrates is asking us to think about what an extremely unjust soul what its character will be. Uh, and uh, what we'll see is that uh, the undemocratic soul is, or the tyrannical soul, is a very unhappy soul. Right? One of the things that we find in tyranny is that these cruel, violent leaders uh, don't have trust for anyone. So they're always guarding themselves close and having to pay off henchmen uh, to look after them. Well, that's going to be a very unhappy state uh, for both uh, a tyrannical city, uh, where basically rule is only done through violence, but also in a tyrannical soul. And that's uh, going to lead back to our original question, right? the question of why we ought to be just. Uh, so the whole, the whole thought here is that uh, democracy is um, an unstable institution. Uh, towards the end of the course, I'm going to have you watch a movie called What is Democracy? that's directed by Astra Taylor. And in one of her interviews, she's speaking with the philosopher Cornell West. And Cornell West points out that one of the challenges that Plato brings out in the eighth book of the Republic isn't just about whether democracy is a good thing, but 
the question of whether democracy is even possible. I guess the thought is, uh, rule by the masses or poor in the name of freedom, rule by the demos, as it were, that's what we're talking about when we talk about the masses and the poor, rule by everybody. The question is, whether that can even be a stable form of government. Uh, because there's this worry that uh, factions uh, will be stirred up and that uh, the possibility of harmony, organization, or unity uh, seems uh, unlikely. Okay, so we're going to stop here. Uh, and... In our next little segment, we're going to look a little bit more closely at some of the problems that Plato sees uh, in a democratic state. Uh, so not only is it unstable, but there are also problems uh, within the state itself uh, that seem to be uh, at least large concerns uh, from Plato's perspective. So we'll pick it up there uh, in just a little bit. Uh, thanks for listening so far.